Unplugged in, President Joe Biden gets to work. We didn't get into this mess overnight. It's going to take, take time for us to turn things around. From vaccine distribution and reviving the economy to repairing alliances and dealing with threats, challenges abound for the new American president. So what I'm hoping is that Biden will have a new vision. Perspectives and the priorities and personality of a new U.S. president. Unplugged in, the new Biden administration. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren, reporting from Washington, D.C., where new leadership is making its presence felt. President Joe Biden ushered in his new administration with a slew of executive orders and a plea for Americans to voluntarily wear a mask in public for the next 100 days to combat the coronavirus pandemic. He is requiring mask wearing in federal government buildings and aboard planes, trains, and buses. Biden reversed numerous Trump administration policies, such as ending construction of a wall along the border with Mexico. He is also dropping the ban on people entering the United States from several Muslim-majority countries. The new president also brought the U.S. back into the Paris Climate Accords and the World Health Organization. Both moves have been welcomed by allies around the world. More from London and VOA's Henry Ridgewell. After four years of turbulent transatlantic relations, the European Union Commission head offered a warm welcome for President Joe Biden. Once again, after four long years, Europe has a friend in the White House. From climate change to health, from digitalization to democracy, these are global challenges that need renewed and improved global cooperation. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson had a warmer relationship with former President Trump. But Johnson said Wednesday he and Biden have a joint common agenda. It's a fantastic uh, thing for America. It's a, a, a step forward uh, for, the, for the country that's been through a, a bumpy period. There were big celebrations in Kosovo where a street bears the name of Joe Biden's late son, Beau Biden, who worked in the country with the U.S. Justice Department following the 1999 Kosovo War. U.S. allies in the Asia-Pacific region also welcomed the new U.S. administration. There's a lot of work for us together, whether it's on climate, on energy, on international security, and importantly, regional security here in the Indo-Pacific. Japan's Prime Minister echoed his Australian counterpart. I hope to closely cooperate with the new president to achieve a free and open Indo-Pacific region. That a clear reference to the perceived threat from China in the Indo-Pacific region. In Beijing, a call for a reset in relations with Washington. We hope that the new U.S. government will view China and our relations in an objective and rational manner. China Wednesday sanctioned outgoing former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and dozens of other Trump officials. Biden's National Security Council called the sanctions unproductive and cynical, a response some analysts say is not surprising. The coming, incoming administration will also maintain a pretty tough on China stance. It's actually an era where I think we'll have some bipartisan agreement on that approach, but one that is again more engaged with allies in doing that. Meanwhile, Iran's leader said the ball was in Biden's court over the future of the 2015 nuclear deal, which the US president has said he wants to rejoin if Tehran meets its commitments. Russia's ambassador to the U.S. called Biden's inauguration a new chapter in relations with Washington. Henry Richwell for VOA News, London. The foreign policy challenges that will face the Biden administration are vast. Michael O'Hanlon is a senior fellow and director of foreign policy research at the Brookings Institution in Washington. We discuss some of the most pressing foreign policy issues facing the Biden-Harris administration. You know, Biden's been a supporter of expanding NATO and bringing it eastward. And we've promised to someday bring uh, Ukraine and Georgia, former Soviet republics, into NATO. That is just, as you know, so incendiary for the Russians. It's not the only issue on which we disagree with the Russians, but it's maybe the issue that we sort of created ourselves 
where on most of the other issues, it was Russian bad behavior that created the issue. And so Biden's going to have to be, I think, a little bit clever, because if he leaves the basic strategy as it's been, keep trying to expand NATO to the east, for example, um, and then, of course, face down Putin, where you do have to challenge him on issues like Russian tinkering in our elections, Russian suppression of its own democracy, Russian aggression in the broader Middle East, those issues we have to oppose Putin. But if you also continue to try to push the idea of eventual NATO expansion, then I think you're guaranteeing a bad relationship with Russia when it doesn't have to be that way and it's dangerous for it to be quite that way. So what I'm hoping is that Biden will have a new vision for European security, especially for the neutral or non-aligned countries that include the former Soviet republics I just mentioned, as well as some other places like Armenia and Azerbaijan, even down to Cyprus, even up to Finland and, uh, and Sweden, and try to think of how we can stabilize that zone and also get Russia to stop aggressing against Ukraine and find a, a new stable concept for Europe. To me, that is the big challenge, but I'm not really sure I've heard anybody on the Biden team tilt that way yet, so I hope they will. How do you factor in the fact that uh, Iran's top scientist has recently been assassinated? Iran has at least said that it is uh, further enriching uranium. Well, I think that the assassination of the Iranian scientist is the sort of thing that will reinforce hostility and anger inside of Iran. But we also know that regime is frankly one of the coldest, most calculating and uh, most Machiavellian on the planet. And I'm sure there'll, there'll be a fair amount of anger, but there won't be a lot of sentimentality about the path forward. I think in the end, they will watch out for their own national interest with or without this scientist being alive. And, uh, and so I think what you're going to see is Iran try to figure out how the world reacts if and when Biden uh, comes in and says, you know, the 2015 deal was pretty good for the time. The times are different and I need, I need something a little broader and longer lasting. And uh, at first, that will not be something Iran wants to hear. And Iran will test the waters to see if America's European allies, as well as Russia and China, uh, will really go along with that approach, or maybe if the United States can be isolated uh, in its desire for a broader arrangement. So that'll, I think, be the initial conversation. Uh, I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. This is going to be one of the huge areas of change, because we know the Trump administration withdrew from the 2015 nuclear deal and had something tantamount to a regime change policy towards Iran, extremely hard line, was not really joined by most of the rest of the world in that policy. And it's not clear where that policy could realistically have led, but it did apply a lot of additional pressure on Iran. And then you throw COVID on top of that, Iran is hurting. So that's the situation that Biden inherits. And he also inherits a situation where in this particular case, on this issue, Trump was not an outlier relative to most Republicans. Most Republicans were very critical of the 2015 nuclear deal because it did not restrict Iran's other activities, such as support for Assad in Syria. And it also began to expire within eight to 10 years of the uh, implementation of that deal. Many of the quantitative restrictions on nuclear activity actually begin to uh, relax in 2023. So I think Biden's got a more difficult job ahead than simply returning to the deal. That's gonna be what Iran expects and demands at first. But Iran may not really have the luxury of holding to that hard line, given the state of its economy. And so Biden may be looking for some kind of an interim arrangement, which uh, lifts some economic pressure and sanctions on Iran, but also refuses to lift them all until there is a longer lasting deal or a broader deal that would engender some Republican support in the United States as well. It's going to be quite a challenge. And for a team that uh, is so vested in this deal because basically everybody on the senior uh, Biden team was part of the Obama team that negotiated the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. They're going to have to be a little bit intellectually flexible to figure out a new path forward rather than just returning to their own baby in the form of the 2015 deal. Turning to China, what do you see with the new administration? Even within the first term of Trump, uh, he went from trying to buddy up with Xi Jinping in the first year to then engaging in a protracted trade war, but then sometimes trying to back off that trade war. And yes, some of that was the peculiarity of Donald Trump, but it also reflected the changing 
view of China in the United States in economic as well as security circles. I think we are in a new era of our relations with what's become the other great superpower uh, on the planet. I would already give China that designation myself. And so I, I think we're going to have a complex relationship we haven't yet sorted out. How does the coronavirus and also even the humanitarian issues like the treatment of the Uyghurs, how does that factor into a Biden presidency? Well, those are two issues where uh, complication and competitiveness are going to be part of the new relationship regardless. There are two of the reasons why. Although on coronavirus, it's actually more complex with the treatment of the Uyghurs and also Hong Kong and also Christians in China and dissent and dis dissidents in China. Uh, there's no ambiguity. Those are all negatives from an American point of view. On COVID-19, what we see here is that, first of all, China may have been the cause, but it's also been part of the solution. It's figured out how to handle this virus better than most Western countries. Also, we have pandemics that could happen in the future that we have to work hard to prevent. And China's got to be part of that conversation. You don't solve that problem with an adversarial relationship or a rivalrous one. That's an example of where we need to cooperate with China. So it's going to be a relationship that's one part competitiveness, one part cooperation. The key is to make sure there's not another part that's outright conflict. I think that has to be the goal. But actually making that happen is, of course, a very complex proposition. One of the problems that has troubled every recent American president is North Korea and its nuclear weapon ambition. And no one has seemed to be able to figure out how to handle North Korea and now Kim Jong-un. We've, we've, we've ignored him. We've had sanctions. We, uh, President Trump tried to talk to him, tried to make almost friends with him. Um, what will President Biden do about North Korea? Because it is marching forward with its nuclear weapon program and its missile program. Well, I hope that President Biden will be a little more flexible on North Korea. And I don't want to say that he should imitate what President Trump did, but he might want to take one or two pages out of the long playbook, most of which was a failure by Trump. But it's worth remembering that Obama failed too. And so did George W. Bush. You know, the overall effort to constrain North Korea's nuclear weapons programs, long range missile programs has failed under presidents of both parties. And when President-elect Trump visited Washington four years ago and President Obama hosted him for the traditional visit of the type that hasn't happened this year, uh, uh, unfortunately. But when Obama was more gracious to Trump than Trump has been to Biden, at that meeting, Obama acknowledged that North Korea policy had been a great failing of his presidency. And Trump took that to heart by all accounts and decided he needed to try something radically new. And he tried several things that were radically new first threatening war in the fall of 2017, and then buddying up to Kim Jong-un with the three summits. And, and then all that petered out and we didn't really get a negotiation strategy that either side was willing to pursue thereafter. So what I hope Biden will do is pick up on the notion that first of all, high level engagement with Kim Jong-un or his government is a good idea. I'm not suggesting that Biden should have summit diplomacy without any deliverables, but there should be intense, high-level engagement with people who can speak for the president of the United States and make a deal. And then secondly, we need to be flexible and realistic about what that deal could entail. We need a little bit of the art of the deal, even though Donald Trump himself could not deliver that deal. And I think it means accepting and acknowledging North Korea is not going to give up all of its nuclear weapons right away. They have too much fear about attack. That is too much a legacy of the father and grandfather of Kim Jong-un. We need a partial deal that in the, in the short term freezes North Korea's ability to make any more bombs. And then in return for that, there's a partial lifting of sanctions and you leave the longer term disarmament for the longer term. I think if, if Biden can be pragmatic in that regard, he has much better prospects for success. How is he gonna differ from his former boss in terms of foreign policy, President Obama? Is he gonna be a, a lot like him or is he gonna be different? Is he gonna be his own man? You know, it's just a fascinating question uh, because, you know, he should try to be his own man, clearly, even if he keeps some of the Obama philosophy. But you could argue, and many, certainly many people have argued, that Obama himself was sort of running out of gas in his foreign policy by the end of his second term. That in his first term, he had this team of rivals, Bob Gates, Hillary Clinton, 
He was projecting big visions and ideas for the world. And in the second term, he was sort of just trying to minimize America's, you know, burdens and uh, losses in places like Afghanistan. He had to deal with the rise of ISIS. He had to deal with the return of Russia and the growing strength of China. And he didn't quite seem to adopt policies that were up to most of these challenges very quickly. So in that regard, Biden, a much older guy and much more a creature of traditional Washington, is going to have to be more innovative than second term Obama. Michael, thank you very much. Always nice to talk to you. Brada, thanks for having me on. President Biden has laid out an ambitious plan to address his top priorities in the first 100 days of his presidency. He wants more money to fight COVID-19 and the economic crisis the pandemic has caused. Biden also wants an expansion of the Voting Rights Act to reduce barriers that keep some people from voting. He also wants the United States to be a leader on the issue of climate change. Accomplishing these goals requires the agreement of the U.S. Congress. Getting legislation passed will be easier for Biden now that Democrats hold the majority, although a slim majority, in Congress. VOA congressional correspondent Catherine Chipson explains. Hi, Joseph Robinette, Biden Jr. do solemnly swear. As he takes office, U.S. President Joe Biden faces considerable challenges. First among them, combating the coronavirus that has killed more than 400,000 Americans. It requires Congress coming together to provide the necessary funding in the COVID relief package and the American Rescue Plan that I will soon be sending to the Congress. Please raise your white hand. But with Vice President Kamala Harris. Do you solemnly swear? and three new senators. Democrats now have control of the U.S. Senate under now Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. The Senate will tackle the perils of the moment, a once-in-a-generation health and economic crisis, and it will strive to make progress on generations-long struggle for racial justice, economic justice, equality of opportunity, and equality under the law. An ambitious agenda for Democrats to pursue, but control of both the White House and both chambers of Congress helps clear the way. Knowing that the president is of the same party, they know that anything comes, that comes out of Congress is likely to get his signature on the bill instead of having a back and forth about a veto and trying to come up with a, a larger uh, base of the, the Congress to vote on something to override any potential veto threat from the president. So it basically comes with unity and agenda control. But Democrats have narrow margins in both chambers of Congress and Republicans will still be able to block some bills that require 60 votes for passage in the Senate. In the House, Speaker Nancy Pelosi can only lose a few Democratic votes, and she has suggested there could be ways to work with Republican lawmakers. We have a responsibility to find bipartisanship where we can, to find our common ground. Quick passage of a new round of coronavirus relief for a struggling American economy comes first. But the new Democratic Senate will also move quickly to confirm the Biden cabinet nominees awaiting hearings. The nomination is confirmed. Unified control also gives the nation's legislative branch a greater ability to enforce government accountability. And within days, the ultimate exercise in checks and balances will begin. I'm actually hopeful for this. Uh, in terms of the impeachment and how that is affected going forward, uh, this is there's no greater sign of accountability than Congress literally holding a presidential impeachment trial. And we, of course, have never seen one after a president has, has left office. So it's kind of the eptimum of, of Congress sticking up for itself and, and making sure that a president is, is, is paying attention or at least doesn't think of himself as above the law. Despite their new majority, Democrats will still need to persuade 17 Republicans to convict former President Donald Trump if they hope to bar him from ever running again for federal office. Katherine Gibson, VOA News, Washington. Susan Page is a Washington bureau chief for USA Today. She has covered six White House administrations. We talked about the challenges facing the new Biden administration. President Biden was vice president for eight years under President Obama, but he's also in the U.S. Senate and on, he was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations uh, Committee. Um, what, what is that going to do when we start looking at foreign policy? I mean, when, when we start looking at the world, um, do you have any thoughts on how he's going to think about China, Africa, North Korea, Iran? 
So he's got uh, very extensive experience on foreign affairs. As you say, this is something he spent decades looking at in Congress. And then eight years, of course, as vice president, very involved in foreign affairs. But some of the lessons we might draw from his attitudes in the past, I think, do not apply at this moment. You know, for instance, you look at policy toward China. That is probably the greatest rival that the United States now faces on a world stage. The situation with China is different now than it was even when Obama was president. And so I think that on an issue like that, you're going to see a kind of rethinking about what U.S. policy ought to be. Not that they want to adopt President Trump's policy toward China, but they also don't think it's right to go back to President Obama's policy. They think it's a moment where you have to kind of figure out what's best moving ahead. Turning to North Korea, um, another problem that for the United States, um, no president has been able to resolve this. We've tried sanctions uh, in, in, in past administrations. President Trump tried to be friends, I guess, for lack of better words, with uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, but meanwhile, North Korea is moving ahead with its uh, nuclear weapons program. You know, this is, is there any problem in foreign policy that is more difficult than our policy toward North Korea? Because as you say, nothing has worked. I am quite certain that President Biden will not continue President Trump's friendship initiative uh, with the North Korean leader. I wouldn't expect an early summit between them or one without conditions uh, or progress made beforehand. But it's in, there are some architects of the earlier North Korea policy that who are now going to be participating, now going to be appointed to the Biden State Department. But it is an issue that has really defied solution President Trump had sort of a tough love approach with um, foreign policy, like with NATO. He demanded that the other countries pay pay what they had earlier agreed to, agreed to in terms of NATO dues. Um, it seems to me that uh, President Biden is going to is going to have a different approach to uh, many of these world leaders who are allies. Your thoughts? He's much closer to our allies, our traditional allies, than President Trump ever was. Uh, I think he will. Uh, assert once again our allegiance to NATO. You know, President Trump talked about withdrawing the United States from NATO. Uh, that would not be the approach that President Biden would take. You know, he not only has, I think, uh, an appreciation for international alliances, he also knows a lot of these leaders himself because of his long experience in government. It's going to be a very different landscape, I think, a very different fundamental attitude toward alliances than the last four years have been. When President Biden was vice president of President Obama, President Obama signed uh, an agreement with Iran on their nuclear program, uh, their weapons programs, which President Trump then uh, pulled out of uh, when he became president. Well, of course, uh, I think that Biden and members of his team wish we had never pulled out of that accord. They supported it. They thought it was uh, flawed, but the best way forward. But at this point, uh, you know, things have happened in the past four years. It makes it difficult for the United States to simply try to jump back in to the nuclear accord. And it's not clear that Iran would agree to that automatically either. So I would think negotiations are going to start with that issue because you know you're listing, you're ticking through the, the most difficult foreign policy and national security challenges that this new president will face. Iran, North Korea, China, you'd have to put those three at the top of the list. Even some Democrats will give President Trump credit for what was done in the Middle East. Um, there are a lot of new relationships with Israel that's made it a safer place for Israel in the Middle East. Um, where, where, what, is, what is President Biden going to do about the Middle East? Do you think he'll continue sort of the, the approach that President Trump has taken, or will he deviate or have his own approach? Well, I, I think he'll have his own approach, but I think, I think you're right. I think some in Washington have been surprised by the relative success and the achievements of the Trump administration when it comes to the Middle East and to and to Israel, uh, you know, as you know, that's a region that's been uh, that's kind of defied the efforts of previous White Houses to make anything that's a lasting peace. I think the number one desire of the Biden administration would be to have less focus on the Middle East, more focus on challenges elsewhere and other regions that they think deserve more attention. And it's possible that some of the steps that the Trump administration is taking will make that more possible. You talk to the Biden people, they would rather talk about Asia than talk about the Middle East. In, in the continent of Africa, it's, we haven't, there hasn't been a lot of discussion with the Trump administration about the continent of Africa, but there are a lot of important things going on. For instance, in Ethiopia, there's a fight over a dam that impacts both Egypt and Sudan. Do you see the United States getting more involved in some of these disputes in other continents or not? Is it going to be hands off? The Trump administration seemed to let, want to let these countries resolve these things themselves. Some other prior administrations have been more involved and helpful in trying to solve problems. Yeah. You know, um, I think the real answer to your question would be, I don't know. Uh, but I can tell you that I haven't heard much about Africa 
in the discussions with Biden folks uh, when they talk about their priorities. So that may be a sign that it is not going to be a first tier concern for them. But actually, since I haven't talked to them about it, maybe that's wrong. So I guess we'll have to wait and see, you know, to what extent the African continent goes high up on the radar screen um, to this White House. Um, immigration. Mm -hmm. That's been a thorny problem that uh, the United States has been grappling with for a long time. President Trump uh, started building a wall. President Biden uh, says no more to the wall. And we see, we see video of people making their way towards the United States. President Biden wants a path towards citizenship for a lot of people. So what's going to happen? With, is the U.S. finally going get to get an immigration policy of some sort? You know, this is going to be one of the leading priorities that the Biden White House is going to have. One of the things he's going to do is send a sweeping immigration bill to Capitol Hill. This was President Trump's kind of core issue. It's one thing he talked about that day in 2015 when he announced his presidential campaign. He talked about immigration, the threat of immigration. It's going to be one of the first things that a President Biden tries to undo to reverse some of the steps that President Trump took, including building that wall, and moves ahead on this issue of the dreamers. You know, this is something that Democrats have been promising since since Barack Obama's presidency in both Obama's presidential campaigns. He promised to try to deal with the issue of the dreamers. It never got happened. This is one of the things that now lands on Biden's plate. Susan, thank you very much. Always nice to talk to you. Greta, thank you. With the promise to vaccinate 100 million Americans for COVID in its first 100 days, the Biden administration has put ending the pandemic atop its agenda. Thanks in part to strict discipline and the ability to enforce mask wearing and social distancing, the U.S. military has so far contained COVID within its ranks. But there's a new challenge, convincing America's all-volunteer military force to voluntarily take the vaccine. VOA's Bill Gallo reports from Seoul. The first doses of the coronavirus vaccine arriving at Camp Humphreys, the largest overseas U.S. military base. A big step toward protecting the nearly 30,000 U.S. troops here in South Korea. But at least for now, the military won't be forcing anyone to receive the vaccine. Military officials tell VOA it could be up to two years before the U.S. Food and Drug Administration gives the vaccine full approval that would allow it to become mandatory. Colonel Doug Luger, the lead U.S. medical officer in South Korea who spoke to VOA remotely, says it's an unusual situation for military leaders. Here in the military, especially, you know, the Army, uh, we're not used to telling people to volunteer or asking them to volunteer for, for things like this. Uh, that's, that's been an interesting uh, uh, thing to work through to help make sure people make good, informed decisions. Like anywhere else, there has been some skepticism about the vaccine, which was developed much more quickly than many expected. To allay those concerns, the military rolled out educational campaigns to combat disinformation. And to set an example, senior leaders were among the first to get the shots. I think we're hitting about the right tone with that, not ceding the battlefield to the conspiracy theorists. Uh, getting the information out there, but on the other hand, not uh, being overbearing or strong army people. Luger says the U.S. military does have experience administering voluntary vaccines, but not at this level or with this much urgency. So far, the plan is working, says Colonel Lee Peter. Since we've seen the vaccine and the people have kind of like observed and watched and did their own uh, research and education, we've seen those numbers grow dramatically to where I would say very few people are now saying, hey, I, I don't want the vaccine. Military officials won't say how many have taken the vaccine here in South Korea. For now, frontline health workers and other critical positions are first in line. Eventually, the vaccine will be available to everyone who wants it. But it's not clear when it will be mandatory. Bill Gallo, BOA News, Seoul. That's all the time we have for now. My thanks to Susan Page from USA Today and Michael O'Hanlon from the Brookings Institution. Keep up with the latest news at voanews.com and follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.